talk to you for a few minutes about a phrase that the Spirit has been dealing with me about. Vibrant, healthy, and full of life. We're going to start out in Luke chapter 19 this morning. If you want to begin turning there. So, for several months now, <clears throat> my wife has been studying the Enneagram. And essentially, it's just a way of understanding your personality and your tendencies. But one thing that has really stood out to me about this, compared to others, is it deals as much with how you react in stress and when things aren't going good as it does when you're at peace and things are on the mountaintop. You see, we all have strengths and weaknesses. We don't always like to show them. We want to keep others from knowing that we have faults and failures but we all deal with them. We all have things that when we lay our head on the pillow at night, we're saying, man, I don't know why I did that. I don't know why that happened. I can't believe I did that. And there's all kinds of things. We may be stressed. We may be stressed at work. We may be stressed with our finances. There may be issues in our family. We may be dealing with pain, either physically or emotionally. We could be dealing with all kinds of things in this life. And then there's always worry and fear. They're always knocking at the door, ready to come in and spend some quality time with you, whether or not you need them. We have these things in this life. We all deal with stuff, as Carl was talking about. I was getting a little concerned he was going to preach the message there for a minute. But that's okay. Word comes from God in himself anyway. It doesn't matter whose lips it's coming through. But then we have things going on in our nation and in our world. We have crime, and we have things on the international scale, wars and disagreements over all sorts of things. Who owns this land and whose people have rights to live on this land? We have all this stuff going on in our world. And there's all kinds of opinions on how to fix it. Some people think that you need a stronger military. Some people think you need a weaker military. Some people think you need more laws. Some people think you need less laws. There's all these opinions floating out there. And if you want to have a fun time, just walk through any bookstore in the self-help section. There's all kinds of people that have written books that are willing to tell you what they think you need to do. Some may be good, some not so good. There's all this stuff. There's all kinds of it. But how do we find the answers that we really need in our life? How do we find what we need for our lives? In Luke chapter 19, it's a familiar story. It's the story of Palm Sunday. Jesus is going toward Jerusalem. And his disciples are with him. And even those who claim to be his disciples or claim to be his followers. There's a great crowd that is gathering. But there's a problem. And if you just breeze through the story, you may not see it. 
but there's a problem. The problem has existed since Christ was born. The problem even exists inside of the 12 disciples. They don't really understand why Jesus came. They have this misconception that He's coming to be a king. That He is going to march into Jerusalem and in the public square He's going to declare that the kingdom of Israel is being reestablished and we will overcome the Roman Empire, kick them out, and we will be a sovereign nation again. That's what everybody there is expecting. And as you read this story, it's called the Palm Sunday story because those that are there start cutting off palm branches and throwing them on the ground in front of Jesus as he rides on the colt up the hill toward Jerusalem. That is the same thing that those people did for kings. In fact, in the Old Testament, you can read an account of where they did something similar for a king as he rolled into Jerusalem. It was paying homage. It was paying respect to a king. But they were looking for a king that wore an earthly crown. They were looking for a king that was going to establish an earthly kingdom. So, when we look at Luke chapter 19, let's pick up the story in verse 37. Then, as he was now drawing near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice, for all the mighty works that they had seen, and they were saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And then some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But he answered to them saying, If these should be silent, the stones would immediately cry out. It was the time for Christ to be praised. And although the Pharisees were at odds with what was going on, Jesus knew that there was nothing that could be done. Because this was an appointed time that God himself had ordained. But then there's another part of this story in verse 41. Now as he drew near to Jerusalem, he saw the city and he wept over it, saying, If you had known, even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace. But now they are hidden from your eyes. For days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you, and close you in on every side, and level you and your children within you to the ground. And they will not leave in you one stone upon another, because you did not know the time of your visitation. They didn't realize what was there. They didn't realize the answer that was in front of their face. Literally. Riding on a donkey. The answer that they were looking for. There are all kinds of answers that we can get. If you search the internet, 
you can find hundreds of answers to anything. Some of them you probably shouldn't trust. But they're there. And there are books in the bookstores from various perspectives. They have answers, but they may not be the right one. You see, the Jewish people had something very special right in their capital city, and they didn't even know it. We as Christians need to understand, we need to realize what we have, how special it really is. You see, Jesus came. He started his earth ministry. He called the twelve to him. He started living with them. They were with him pretty much 24-7. He was constantly teaching them and showing them things, truths that would rock their world. And even after all of that, even after all the teaching, and even after all of the time that they spent seeing him raise dead people, heal sick people, and pronounce to countless people that they were saved, that their sins were forgiven, they still were looking for the sword to be drawn and for the king to declare war on their enemies. They didn't see what was there. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, there is a passage, we will look at it here in just a moment, that talks about how the Jewish people didn't see, they didn't realize what they had. Jesus was pouring into those 12 disciples constantly. And at one point he told them, there's a lot more that I want to teach you, but you're not ready for it yet. But I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is going to help teach you the stuff that I haven't been able to yet. He will guide you into truth. He is there to help us to realize what we have. It's something that this world doesn't have. If you read every self-help book that you can get your hands on, you may increase your knowledge. You may find some good tricks and tips to help you in your life. But there's something that that cannot give you. And that is eternal salvation. Eternal life. So in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, So Paul is speaking in this passage. And he's talking about how the Old Testament, the Old Covenant was so glorious that Moses, when he came back from getting the Ten Commandments, put a veil over his face because he was glowing, literally, with the glory of God. And he's telling the Corinthian people, that that was glorious, yes. But God has given us something even better now, and it's all the more glorious. If that which is passing away was glorious, how much more glorious is what Christ has brought for us? 
So if you look at verse 12, Therefore, since we have such hope, we use great boldness of speech, unlike Moses who put a veil over his face so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the end of what was passing away. <clears throat> but their minds were blinded, for until this day the same veil remains unlifted during the reading of the Old Testament, because the veil is taken away in Christ. But even to this day when Moses is read, is read a veil lies on their hearts. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. When one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. The thing that is hidden, the thing that we don't understand, is revealed when we turn to the Lord. Not when we turn to Barnes & Noble. Not when we turn to Google. When we turn to the Lord. That is when those things are revealed. That is what Jesus came to do. His hours and hours and hours of teaching to those disciples was to help them to start to get a glimpse of what it means to be a child of God. It was to help them to start to understand who they are because salvation has come to this world. Because God Himself loves us so much that He gave. And His grace, His peace, His love, His joy is poured out for us. That veil is lifted when we turn to the Lord. He is there. He is still there, just like He was teaching those disciples. He is still there every morning. He's saying, I've got something I'd like to show you today. This will rock your world just a little bit, but it's really cool. Come on, let me show you. I have this truth. I have this powerful, life-giving truth that I want to give you today. And when you are on your job, when you are walking through the supermarket, it's going to explode within you. And you're going to see, you're going to just sit back and you're going to see my hand moving right in front of you. And it's going to be glorious. And I want to show this to you. Would you sit down and listen for a few minutes? Would you sit down and hear what I want to tell you, what I want to show you? Would you give me a few minutes of your time so that I can help you? That is the Savior that we have, and that is what His Holy Spirit is here to do. He's here to lift that veil. He's here to show us the things that we need, the things that we need for our lives, the things that we need for our families. When our kids aren't going the way that we think they should go. When our relationships are on the rocks. When we've got our 25th new boss in the last five years. When everything is going haywire in our lives. He's saying, let's just, let's just take a step back for a minute. I know there's a lot going on in your life right now. Let's just take a step back. Come over here. Sit down with me. Let's open this book, this word that I have given you, and I want to show you something. That's why he came. He came for the individual. He didn't come to establish a nation, not a nation of this world. His kingdom is not of this world. It is not the United States of America. It is not Israel. It is not any of the other countries. His kingdom is a kingdom in the spirit. 
And He came to help us to see that although we live in these earthen vessels, that we're not a part of that kingdom. We are a part of His kingdom. As we turn to the Lord, the veil is lifted. So let's read just a couple more verses in this passage. These are some strong verses even in their own right. Verse 17. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. The Lord, God Himself, is the Spirit, and where His Spirit is, there is liberty. The veil is lifted. We are no longer bound by the world's system. We have been liberated from this world's system. We don't need to stay up half the night worrying about what Congress is or isn't doing. We're not a part of that system. We pray for the system that God's will would be done, but we're not concerned about the outcome of that system because our outcome is tied in Jesus Christ. Our outcome is promised in the Word of God. So we place our faith, our trust, our hope, our belief in God Himself. But where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. There is freedom. When you are facing a situation in your life, circumstances come up in your life. Some of the stuff we talked about is happening. If you have been spending every day, day after day, day after day, doing things on your own by yourself. When stuff comes at you, your first reaction is going to be, I've got to take care of this. How am I going to handle this? But if you have been spending that time looking to the Lord and the veil is lifted, you don't just see the circumstances anymore. You see the answer. And you know who the answer is. And you start placing your faith and trust in Him. And then guess what? This little thing called peace settles into your spirit. But if we're striving in our own strength, if we are doing it by ourselves, we're not guaranteed that peace because it's our own strength and our own strength may not be enough. The last verse of that chapter says, but we all with an unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of God, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory by the Spirit of the Lord. Now, that verse can take a while to unpack, but I'll try to get it done few minutes. With unveiled face. In the Greek, when you look at what is being said there, when it is talking about having an unveiled face, it is not a one-time deal. The tense of the verb is constant. Constantly unveiled face. Perpetually unveiled face. So we because we have looked to the Lord, we now have this 
perpetually unveiled face. It doesn't come and go. When we are looking to the Lord, we should be seeing things that are spiritual. We should be seeing the truth of the kingdom. It is constant. It should be a constant in our lives. But we are beholding the glory of the Lord as in a mirror. And it says, as we behold His glory, that we are being transformed into the same image. Now, if you spend time just reading Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and looking at Jesus, His life, His story, there are a lot of wonderful, wonderful things just in there. You can spend years just studying that and constantly have truth revealed to you. And Paul says to the Corinthians that as we look toward the Lord, we start to see His glory as if it's in a mirror. And we are starting to take on His image. We are being transformed. We are being changed. Now the word for transformed here is a word in the Greek that we get the word metamorphosis from. It is like the caterpillar that crawls in and builds a cocoon and then comes out as a beautiful butterfly. It is literally a transformation on the outside. It is something new and different. But the transformation happens from the inside out. It doesn't happen from the government down. It doesn't happen from the pastor to the pew. It happens from the inside out. That is how the things of the Spirit work. And as we look toward the Lord, as we look to God, as we look toward Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, then things start manifesting on the outside. That transformation, that change starts happening. And we take on the image of Christ. Now, this word for transform is only used four times in the Bible. It is used in two of the Gospels when it is talking about Jesus when he went up onto the mountain and he was transfigured and it said that he started to glow and his clothes turned bright, shining white. And then a couple of his friends from heaven came down and started talking with him for a few minutes. A transformation that doesn't make sense according to what we know in, in this world. I personally have not seen anyone that started glowing on their own or their clothes transformed into bright, shining white. I have not witnessed such a phenomenon on this earth. But the glory was so intense that it radiated. And then, my boy Peter, the one that always likes to uh, talk first and think later, says, hey, let's build, some, let's build some temples. Let's build some tabernacles because this is awesome. This right here is awesome. We need to memorialize this. Just as we memorialize the crossing of the Red Sea, just as we memorialize the taking of Jerusalem, the taking of Jericho, we need to build some memorials right here, right now. Come on. I'm ready. I'll start building it right now. Let's go. And then God speaks from heaven and says, this is my beloved son. Listen. He has to listen. You see, 
we see these miracles. We can see things happen. And they bring, they bring such awe and wonder to our souls that we can start building a memorial to that miracle. But we're not supposed to be looking to the miracles. We're supposed to be looking to the Lord. And as we're looking to the Lord, as we keep looking to the Lord, and we keep following His Word, and we keep following His Spirit as it leads us, we start seeing more miracles. And if we stop and we start gazing at the miracles. Oh, they're shiny, they're bright, they're cool. I want to look at the miracle for a moment. Oh, oh, I need to be over here. It says that these signs will follow those who believe. It doesn't say these believers will follow these signs. These signs are going to follow you. And who are you following? Jesus. Luke chapter 19. They were praising and worshiping because of the great works that Christ had done. They were still looking at the wrong thing. They were looking at the wrong thing. But God is saying, I want to show you something new today. I want to show you something that is completely different. And it's just for today. Because I know who you're going to have a conversation with in the break room at work. I know what phone call you're going to get. And I want to show you something that has you ready for it. I know what's going on in your family right now. And I know what you need. And I want to show you some truth. Some truth that will help you. So I mentioned that this word for transform or change occurs in a few different places. The other one is Romans chapter 12. Verse 2, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by renewing your mind. Well, how do you renew your mind? Is it spending countless hours reading? Or praying? You see, any of those actions you can start to become religious in. You can start to just do them because it's your duty. Because it's what you're supposed to do. And I always do this, and I have to always do this, or my coffee doesn't taste as good. But what we're supposed to be doing is looking to the Lord. Not to the book. His Word will speak to us, but we're supposed to be looking through the lens of the Word, to Him. And we're supposed to be listening to His voice. Do you know that if you're listening, you can read an obscure verse in the middle of the Old Testament and God can give you a revelation that rocks your entire week? That sets you free from something that you've been battling against for months. But it's because we're looking to Him. We're looking to Him to help us. You see, He didn't come to fix nations. He come to fix us. He come to fix me. With all the stuff that I'm not good at, If you would have asked me when I was a kid if I would be speaking in front of people, 
I would have told you you're crazy. My picture was beside the word shyness in the dictionary. That's not me. I'm not the guy that comes in the room and starts talking. I'm the guy that comes in the room, sits on the back seat, and keeps quiet. That's who I am naturally. But God chooses different paths. And He knows how to use us. He knows how to help us. He knows how to give us strength. But He's come for us. He's come for each one of us individually. You see, me or the pastor or any minister, we can't be with you 24-7. It's not always possible for us to be there to answer your question. As much as any of us would like to be able to do that, we can't. And then, if we start doing that, it sets up this unhealthy relationship where you become dependent on the person and you're not looking to the Lord. You're not looking to God. You're not looking to Jesus. You're looking to Mike Foe or whoever else. And in my opinion, that's why some ministers wind up quitting. It's because they become that person to too many people in their congregation. And too many people are depending on them instead of on them. You see, we're given a commandment to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. The power of the Easter message is that we have been given salvation. But the salvation is for each one of us individually. And we have this spirit that has come to bring liberty to us. And he wants to have some time with us. He wants to show us some stuff. So, some of you may know, but last weekend didn't go according to my plans. I was laying in bed asleep, and about 1.30 in the morning, I get a phone call. Early Saturday morning that my dad was being rushed to the hospital with a heart attack. Not exciting news. And immediately I started thinking about what I should do. And me and Krista talked about it for a few minutes. And we decided that we needed to head toward the hospital. You know, it's not a quick drive because the hospital's over four hours away. But we started heading that way. And... We got there, and they had been working with my dad, doing all that medical knowledge knows how to do. But as much as we know how to do with medicine, there's still this point that medicine doesn't go beyond. And we know a lot. It's amazing what we have knowledge of in the medical field today. But nothing they had done for my dad for the pain had worked. Nothing. And 
And I do not handle people that are in severe pain well because I empathize. And when I start empathizing, I start taking their pain on in myself. It's not a good thing. So, if I had stood there in my own strength, I would have caused myself greater stress because I would have been doing it in my own strength. But I started praying in the Spirit. Because there was nothing I could do in my strength. The doctors and nurses were doing what they could do. But it hadn't been successful yet. So I just started praying in the Spirit. And it wasn't some grandiose, hey, look at me, I'm praying kind of deal. I don't even like sharing the testimony of it because I don't want you to look at me or what I did. My God showed up in that hospital. That is why Christ came. It's to be with us in those times when we need Him. Not so that we can pray, pray some prayer and be noticed in front of people. But when you're in that hospital room and the doctors don't know what to do. When you are dealing with a relationship and no amount of counseling is fixing the relationship. When your finances are in shambles. He wants to be there for us, for me. I'm nothing special. But he wants to be there for us. Palm Sunday is a day when the Jewish people were celebrating what they thought they were getting. And yet, Jesus stops and he starts to weep because he knew they didn't get it. He knew they just did not understand. Church is not about showing up on Sunday or Wednesday or to small group. It's not a social club. It's a place where we get to spend time with people who love Jesus. And we share some of the wonderful things that He's done in our lives some of the revelations that he's given us. And we can build each other up. Because not only does he speak to us through his word, but there's a reason that he says, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. It's because I might accidentally say something that helps you. Not in my own strength, but because His Spirit is working. And if you're listening, you can hear His Spirit in some of the weirdest places. Been sitting in the middle of a movie theater, watching a movie, secular movie, not a Christian movie, watching a secular movie. Bam! Where did you come from? And then I was chewing on it for days. A revelation. That's what he wants for his children. 
He wants that relationship with us. He wants to say, you know something? Watch this. I'm going to really, I'm going to really twist them around for a second. Bam, sit in the middle of Starbucks, and all of a sudden you get a revelation of John 3.16 that just sits you back and you're going, I've read that verse a thousand times. I never saw that before. That's what he's there for. So, my dad started doing better. And they were getting his medications figured out to keep him stable. And they moved him out into a regular room from the cardiac care unit. And he was acting like his normal self. Everything except he didn't feel like running or doing he needed rest, but he was acting like his normal self. So Krista and I came home. And then Monday morning, just after midnight, I got another phone call. Not a good weekend. My mom says, son, I don't know what's going on. Your dad's had a stroke. He was sitting in the chair, and all of a sudden he was trying to get my attention. He couldn't talk. He was babbling. He, I, I, I don't know what's going on. And inside myself, I said, Seriously? Something else this quick? And I'm not the quickest one to wake up and get started in the morning. I'm, I'm, I like to take my time getting up. So I was kind of half out of it, half out of it and I said, well, I'll be praying. And I got off the phone with her. And I told Krista what was going on. And then my brother calls me and he says, Mom called me. I'm on my way to the hospital, which he lives close, so he can get there a lot quicker than I could. But I, you should call Mom and pray with her. I think she needs someone to be there for her. And... I knew that that's what I was supposed to do. I knew that I needed to do that in that moment. So I got on the phone with my mom and I asked her if I could pray with her. And then scripture after scripture just started flowing. And I started declaring in the name of Jesus, what was going on. They had taken my dad out of the room. They had taken him down for some scans to see what was going on. And just a minute after I stopped praying, they wheeled my dad back in the room my brother shows up and my dad is almost back to normal. That is our God. He is an awesome God. 
we need to know who he is. Medicine may not have the answers. Charles Schwab may not have the answers. Donald Trump may not have the answers. All the books that you can get may not have the answers. but a few minutes with the king can download more answers into you than you thought was possible. And they're the answers you need in that moment. That's why Jesus came. He came to seek and save those of us that were lost so that he could reveal his glory to us so that we could be given the right, the privilege of becoming and being called the children of God. He came for us. He came for us on Monday morning. Just as much as he came for us on Sunday morning. Every day. He wants to reveal stuff to us. He wants to be that help for us. I don't know what anyone in here will face in the future. I don't know what I will face in the future. I don't even know what I'm going to eat for lunch. But he knows the end from the beginning. He already knows everything about the moment. He already knows. He says, you know what? This verse right here. I want to show you something in this verse that will make your Monday feel like a Friday. I want to make your day a day of peace and joy. Because I love you. He loves all of us. That is the goodness of our God.